Hi everyone, um, Michael Fisher, uh, good to see you again. Um, this time I'm gonna be talking about DBDAO. So this is the project I sort of work on full time and we have a team behind it. And it's basically like the Firebase for Web3 DSI or apps. And I'll explain how we're gonna do it. So DSI and DData. So we've talked a lot about funding. We've talked a lot about um, sort of building uh, DAOs, but now we're going to sort of, I, I, the thing that I'm really interested in is how do you build, um, how do you do the science? How do you do the data science? How do you do the collection of data? How do you curate these data sets? How do you build these sort of data pipelines? And so, you know, scientific research is based on empirical data and DSI has the ability to have many eyes on individual pieces of data and hopefully lead to more reproducibility. So we looked at sort of the landscape in doing like you know, traditional web app development or any development. And for web two, you have, if you want to do storage, you use S3. And you, for web three, you do IPFS. For hosting, you can use Vercel. And for web three, you have Fleek. For name service, you can do DNS. For web three, you do ENS. Servers, you can do AWS Lambda. Um, and you for web three, you can do ENS, smart, you can do smart contracts. But like the database component is still sort of this amorphous missing part of building like a web three style application. So um, why do we need it is like the goal here would be to have like, you know, one is to incentivize people to contribute data. The fact that people are putting data into databases today and not being paid is a little bit backward. Like the fact you don't ever want to pay for data storage. You should be paid to have your data. You should put your data in somewhere and get data out. Money should come out the other way. So that's like negatively priced data. The other thing is like data should live online forever. Like uh, there should be the, for all this scientific research, you need data permanence. And for either whether you're building an application or doing these science, um, you should have composability between data projects. So when you have a database, uh, you should be able to link that to another database and have it interoperable. And you can't really do that today with traditional databases where they're closed and on a centralized server. Data ownership, so being able to own the data that's created privacy if you need it through encryption. It's, the data should be tied strongly to your identity. And you know you just want the database to be generally interoperable with um, Web3 standards like your wallet, your ENS, sign in with Ethereum, uh, Lit protocol, and you know, all these different things need some sort of native data and just sort of like be very interoperable with the existing data sets. So um, we looked at sort of like what the database landscape looks like as you know, one of the things you want to do is incentivize good co content and disincentivize bad content, which we'll talk about in a second. You want to pay people to administer the, the database so that they're curating content in real time. You want to be able to audit the database. So right now you submit data. You don't actually have any verification that what you submitted was actually put into the database. That database could, that row could just disappear. So you need to be able to uh, track, track the changes that are being done to a database. Um, you want to be able to link databases together. And for a lot of applications, you want it to be default open so that you have interoperable, so that you have, uh, you know, people can see the data. I think there's just many applications where openness seems to be better than closed. And you want it to be indexable and an easy drop in SQL developer experience. So I'll just say, like, right now we're doing projects with LabDAO and SciDAO to do um, large scale, like, psychedelic research on, like, a generalized, a general, um, uh, clinical trial. And then we're also working with Charmverse. Is, um, and so um, I'll just this is like a one slide overview of what DBDAO does is basically it like tokenize, it incentivizes, it provides like the structure to incentivize people to contribute data into a database. So a database can monetize in a variety of ways through like subscriptions or through advertisements or through a benefactor paying for scientific research. And anyone who contributes to that database and contributes data, whether it be a personal health record or a lab experiment or anything, we want to be able to pay those people. And then what we do is we like tokenize every piece of content. So every row in the database becomes an NFT that can be bought or sold. And then um, like sort of like what they were talking about in the last lecture. And then um, the database is then managed by a DAO. So an important part is when you have an open database that's sort of accessible to everyone, the curation process of creating the data set is important. You don't just want a lot of people entering spam. So the idea is like when people enter data into the database, then we share the rewards equally. And like the top case, like business model here is that individually when someone puts has one piece of data, it's not super useful. But when you start to compile larger sets of data, you have like 
uh, non-zero sum value created by multiple pieces of data. So there's many different, the, we, we offer people tools basically to curate a database based on different standards. You can look at like some people want to have very easy to get into databases if you're just playing around with data sets. But if you're about to publish something on a clinical trial or you're trying to publish a paper, your standards for which you allow data into or out of your database are going to vary greatly. Um, so every row in the data, when you when you add a row to the database, what's actually happening on the back end is you're minting an 1155 token, and uh, that allows um, that allows for a lot of interoperability. Um, this token, like a token traditionally an NFT, is like backed by a board ape or something, and the IP of that picture. In this case, it's backed by the JSON that is in there. So if you have a piece of data, we encode that into a JSON object and then wrap that in an NFT. And what's cool is once it's in token form in an NFT, it's compatible with all DeFi protocols. So you could do lending or staking based on the IP of your NFT, which is kind of cool. Um, so then lastly, another thing is like, we have this uh, concept of like incentivizing good content and disincentivizing bad content. So the incentive to like get into the database is you get paid when your data, when your data is used or successful. Um, so that's sort of the carrot we use to incentivize people, but you also want to disincentivize bad content. So we have this concept of staking on rows. And basically when you submit a row to the database, you have to submit it along with like a dollar, say this is a parameter set by the database administrator and, uh, or 50 cents. And then if your row is accepted, you get your 50 cents back um, by the by the database administrator. But if your row is rejected and if you're just submitting spam to the database, you get slashed and you don't get your deposit back. And the idea here is this sort of disincentivizes uh, people from posting bad content. Now, the, the question is, is okay, how do, then you sort of have to trust the curator. Like what prevents them from just slashing everything? And we basically have a, a log because everything is on the blockchain of every decision that they've made. So we have this like a log chain and you can go back and you can look back to see if the curator has been making decisions and removing content or not allowing certain types of content into the database, then you should not trust that curator anymore and you should move to another database where the curator is doing a better job of curating the data set. So we have this idea that like we want interoperability. So we work together with schema.org in order to have uh, like open standards for things. So if you're curating uh, cell data or book data or person data, we encourage you to use um, things that are already schemas that are already available on schema.org. And we have a builder to help you build your database and schema for your database in a very open way. So then it the, comes to the idea of like a database administrator and the database administrator here is actually a Gnosis safe. So you could have many people. So the idea is if you're just one person and you're curating a large data set, you don't want to have to make every decision yourself. So what you can do is you can deputize a number of um, people to also work on your behalf to accept or reject content. And they're all um, multi-signers of this Gnosis safe. And so a, data, a, a, a Gnosis safe can be one person, it can be a team of people, it could be a jury, it could be a DAO, it could be people on Mechanical Turk, it could literally be anything. It can be an AI too, which is interesting. So you can have an AI like GPT-3 automatically accepting or rejecting things. So if someone were to build a social media application, or if you wanted to have a large scale science project, you could train an AI to automatic, to be a signer on the Gnosis safe and automatically accept or reject certain types of content. Um, we also do use encryption to encrypt. Sometimes you want um, certain columns to be private. So we use lit protocol, which is basically like an NFT based uh, encryption mechanism to encrypt certain parts of the database so that only certain people have it, which is kind of cool is like, here's a use case is like have all the names on one side and then the email address is over here to get access to the email addresses. You need to have the NFT that decrypts things. So that's kind of interesting. That's be useful for DSI. And then we can do ZK queries on certain things. So we're working on this thing to basically uh, to have a Merkle root, Merkle, ca Merkle cache basically of the database and then do ZK queries on certain parts of it. And here's a short demo of how it works. So this right here is the database. So we mint a database. We have different parameters here. Uh, here's the schema for it that defines the database. This is for the SciDAO integration. Here's the schema we use. Um, these are the defaults that exist. 
And so what we do, we're on Arbitrum and Avalanche right now. So we mint the database and uh, MetaMask pops up. The database was minted. We go see the transaction on Arbitrum. So that's the transaction that mints the database. Then what we wanna do is we wanna add a row to the database. So these are some defaults that are already there. And then we mint that database, we mint that row. Then the row gets along with that slight deposit that we had, which is like, in this case, a dollar. And because we're the admin, we can have the ability to add or remove this row from the database. So for fun, we'll remove it. So that's kind of the demo of how it works. So the uh, rewards. So when you add, well, the database can monetize. Someone say someone, a drug company buys the, uh, pays a lot of money for all the data that is in the database. Uh, the network gets 10%. The database administrator, the person who organized all the data gets 30%. Uh, the scouts get 60%, and then the viewer, the person who views the data, we're playing around with this idea of uh, having 5% go back to them. Um, that's it. So we you can check out dbdao.xyz. We have a white label app, open source, freely available. The whole project is open source. Um, you can email me or telegram me on go, 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 Michael, and my email address is there. Thanks.